are men supposed to be in authority over women? Uh, in the church, we call that male headship. Is that the norm? Is that the standard? And this is the passage that people go to to talk about that. Uh, there's a lot of confusion around this passage. There's also some really poignant moments of clarity and that I think actually cut through some of the confusion. Let's dig in. We're going to spend some time and walk through this important yet very sticky passage. And for me, it actually has been really compelling that there, there are some real encouraging takeaways from this passage that I think are missed because of the swirling debate. So let's jump in. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul writes this, Follow my example just like I follow Christ's. I praise you because you remember all my instructions and you hold on to the traditions exactly as I handed them on to you. Now, I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man. The head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered shames his head. Every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered disgraces her head. It is the same thing as having her head shaved. If a woman doesn't cover her head, then she should have her hair cut off. If it is disgraceful for a woman to have short hair or to be shaved, then she should keep her head covered. A man shouldn't have his head covered because he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is man's glory. Man didn't have his origin from woman, but woman from man. And man wasn't created for the sake of woman, but woman for the sake of man. Because of this, a woman should have authority over her head because of the angels. However, Woman isn't independent from man, and man isn't independent from woman in the Lord. As woman came from man, so also man comes from woman. But everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it appropriate for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Doesn't nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory? This is because of her long hair given to her for a covering. But if someone wants to argue about this, we don't have such a custom, nor do God's churches. Okay, well, there is a lot of confusion about this passage. It's used quite a bit, especially in uh, connection both around women leading in the church and also the relationship between men and women in marriage. Um, I'm going to save the marriage talk to Ephesians 5, and we'll, we'll rope in 1 Corinthians 11 because it's used in that context. But here, he's specifically talking about what happens in the church service. When you gather as a church, what, how are you going to conduct yourselves as men and women. And so let's stay there. Um, there Again, a lot that we need to unpack. We're going to talk about this term headship or head. We're going to talk about authority. We're going to talk about why this, why head coverings. And uh, some of the strangest words here is uh, verse 10. What, what's going on because of the angels? We're going to get to that just a little bit. Uh, there's also some really, some clarity that I think right off the bat we can get to. Uh, and so maybe we'll start with that. The thing, uh, so when I look at a passage like this, I say, okay, it's actually really confusing. There's a lot that I don't understand. Why is he so fixated on head coverings? What is going on here? Um, I'm going to first look at, so is there anything that actually is really clear? Uh, let's start with that. So, clarity is there are two functions that he assumes both men and women are doing equally. So, when you get together, every man prays or prophesies with his head covered, shames his head. Every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered disgraces her head. Uh, so, right off the bat, we still haven't covered why the, why the different coverings. Um, but it is actually really clear that he is expecting men to pray and prophesy. And he uses the exact same phrase. He's expecting every woman to pray and prophesy. Right? And so he's describing a church service. And when you come together in church, he's expecting that men are going to pray and prophesy out loud. And women are going to pray and prophesy out loud. And it's really interesting uh, this is a passage that is used to say women can't do certain forms of leadership in the church, but when you actually get through some of the confusion, he only lists two things, and both men and women are doing those two things. So that's really interesting. Uh, now, some scholars have pointed out, and I, I tend to agree with this interpretation, but you could argue that by using the phrase pray and prophesy, Paul is summarizing the entire church service. I mean, if prayer is what we do when we talk to God, and prophecy is what we do 
when we communicate to the people, that pretty much covers the entire church service, right? Um, everything that we do, prayer, worship, is a form of prayer. Prophecy, preaching, teaching, everything else is a, is a form of prophecy. Um, so that, that you, you might not go with that, but I, I tend to um, think that Paul is actually just describing the entire, entire church service, because otherwise, why wouldn't he have listed off everything? He could have listed prayer and singing and teaching and communion. He could have listed off everything. Instead, he just sums it up by pray and prophesy. Uh, you don't have to go with that. You could think that he's he is talking about two specific functions within the church. Uh, but to bring some clarity to this, he is assuming, again, that men and women are doing the exact same thing. Now, their form, uh, so their role is the same. Their form is a little different, and we'll get in to that. But that's the clearest part of this whole passage is what's going on here? He's describing the church service and he assumes that both men and women should both be praying and prophesying. But they do it a little differently. Okay, so that's the clarity. Now let's get to some of the confusion and there is a lot. So uh, we're going to talk about headship first, shall we? Now this word head in Greek is kephale. Uh, in Hebrew, it would be the word rosh, and I've done a deep dive into headship over the last couple years. And uh, here's my short take. We, this would this would be a much longer video, but uh, let's let's start with English. In English, we use head in a couple different ways. Uh, one, we might say like actually the literal biological definition of head, right? So a human body. So that would be the first major definition. If you just saw the word head on a page, that's probably going to be your go-to definition. The second, uh, moving more into the realm of metaphor, is a leadership metaphor, right? And so with leadership, that would be like head of state um, or the head honcho or whatever it is, right? And so we use the word head as a, as a metaphor for the leader. The third definition, this is still as a metaphor, would be as source. And so we have the trailhead or the head of a river. It, it means the beginning, the source. In, um, in the, the, the Hebrew Bible, they use rosh in, in these three ways as well. So biological leadership, the head of the chief of a clan, or source. Uh, Rosh Hashanah is the, the Jewish New Year. It means the head, the, the start of the new year. And rosh, right there, that word source is right in there. Um, Bereshit is the very first word in the Hebrew Bible, and it means in the beginning, uh, at, the, the, at the beginning. And it's right there in the, in the middle of the word Bereshit is rosh, source, head. And so they, they use this metaphor of source. The Greek word kephale also uses the same thing. Now here is my main argument uh, through, through a deep dive into this word, especially in the Greek, is in Greek literature these final two definitions would be reversed. In other words, the first, if you saw the word kephale on a page, you would go with biology. This means someone's head. Uh, the second most prevalent understanding as a metaphor would actually be source more than leadership. Leadership is a more of a minority usage because they have other words for leadership, like arche. And so when they're talking about the leader or the chief of of something, they would more readily go to other words that mean leader, um, and and only rarely would they use the word as as leader. And so, uh, I just set that up to say I actually think the more I dwell on this, that especially in this passage, uh, but many others, using the seeing the word head as source makes way more sense than leader. Um, now it gets into some, so when he, what is he talking about here? He's talking about, let's, let's just go with me for a little bit. Let's see if it works. Now I want you to know that the source of every man is Christ and the source of every woman is man and the source of Christ is God. Uh, scholars have pointed out that, that that final phrase poses some problems. Uh, the source of Christ is God. Well, that was one of the early church heresies that Christ was not eternal, but he emanated from the Father at some point. He was created, in other words. And I, of course, I reject that. I don't think that's the point. It's a metaphor. Um, but it does actually work in the, in the relational sense that the Father begets the Son eternally, forever. There was never a beginning point of that begetting. But there is 
that, that still makes sense in the context of our understanding of the Trinity. Uh, and I would also point out that the flip side, to say no head always has to mean leader, and that's one of the arguments that maybe complementarians have tried to give, to say, no, that means that the Father is always the in authority over the Son, also poses a lot of problems with how we understand the Trinity. Uh, and many scholars, even on the more complementarian side, have tried to argue that out. So all I'm saying, head is leader, Verse 3 out of context, you could go with that. Uh, verse 3 out of context, head is source, also makes sense. And it doesn't, it, it maybe gives us a slightly different take on what this head of Christ as God means. But uh, I don't think ultimately it poses a lot of problems for a Trinitarian belief set. Um, so, but let's let's take it to the passage itself. Could, me, could head mean source in the rest of this passage? And I actually think it primarily, it has to. Let's, let's skip down to verse 8, for example. Verse 8, man didn't have his origin from woman, but woman from man. Man wasn't created for the sake of woman, but the woman for the sake of man. He's literally, he's taking this whole section and he's rooting it in Genesis chapter 2, right? And that's the story where God made Adam from the dust. He breathed life into Adam and then he took from Adam's side and created woman. And he's, he's rooting this whole conversation in the fact that woman is not independently created, but is dependent on man. He, she was created from the side of Adam. And so he, he's using the image of source directly in this passage. So that, I think, bolsters this claim that head means source up here. Uh, and then he goes on, however, woman isn't independent from man, and man isn't independent from woman in the Lord. As woman came from man, so also man comes from woman. So he's, he's saying, look, the ultimate source Man was created first, and then woman, and they're not independent from each other. But in the practical outworkings of relationship in the church, now, well, every man is born of a woman. Uh, just as the original woman came from man, now all of us are born from women, and so none of us are independent. We're all dependent on each other. There's this mutual dependency that Paul is pulling on. But that alone, like taking in verse 8 through 12... I feel it really underlines the my claim that head means source. He literally takes us to the original source of humanity, and he's talking about source here. And so uh, he's saying, in other words, when he's talking about headship, I don't actually think he's talking about anyone having authority over anyone else. He's not saying that men or husbands have authority over the woman in, in any real sense. Uh, but he is trying to say we're, we're linked. We're dependent upon one another. Uh, so then he gets to this headship piece. And what's going on here? This, this again, is hard to understand. There's been a few ideas that have been tossed out I don't think work. So one common way that I've heard uh, people understand this text is that Paul was doing something culturally specific to Corinth or to the, the Greco-Roman world. Uh, you'll hear teachers today say that uh, for a woman to have her hair uncovered was uh, the only women who, who kept their hair uncovered in the public square were prostitutes, right? And so this idea of not covering her hair, is that the idea like, uh, or some would say, you know, you wouldn't go into a church in uh, a bikini, right? Because that would, that would just not be appropriate. There are certain types of dress that's appropriate for certain areas. I wouldn't go to a funeral or a wedding or a church in my bathing suit. Uh, and so is that what Paul's doing? He's just going pure context in the culture, out on the street. It's shameful for women to have their hair uncovered in the first century, and so they should keep their heads covered. That really doesn't make sense on so many levels. Uh, for one thing, he's only referring to what happens in the moment of prayer and prophecy. So if the woman is up on stage, she's praying and she's prophesying, that's when she has her hair covered. Uh, if, if it was the case of um, people are going to look at you like you're a prostitute, he, he certainly would have said this is the case all the time, right? No, but he's actually saying when a man goes up to pray and prophesy, he has to uncover his head. When a woman begins to pray or prophesy, she must cover her head. They're doing the same thing, but they're doing it in a different form. Uh, if it was about a cultural uh, norm, then that would be 
the standard at all times, not just during that one moment of prayer. So that really doesn't make sense. Let's just cross that out. Uh, there's another aspect that's really interesting to this. In the ancient world, uh, we actually know that it was customary in the Jewish context for the men to cover their head. Uh, still to this day, the men, uh, Jewish men wear the talit, uh, the head covering, uh, as a symbol of being under under their God and under the law. Right? And so it's the men who actually wear the head covering, not the women. And in the Greek world, this one's fascinating, I kind of learned this more recently, uh, there's also evidence that the priests and the, the, the male priests leading the worship in the temple were the ones that covered their head. So the men covered their head. There's a statue in a museum in Corinth to this day that has the Emperor Augustus praying and, and offering sacrifices at a temple covering his head. And so that's really interesting. It, it, the, the argument that it's purely cultural doesn't actually hold up because both on the idea that it's scandalous doesn't work because he's only referring to one function within the church service. And the idea that it's cultural, in other words, the rest of the, the rest, the, both the Jewish and the, the Gentiles uh, would, be, would be offended by women praying and prophesying with her head covered and men vice versa doesn't make sense because in their worship they did it reversed. The women had their hair uncovered and the men would cover their heads uh, in a symbol of humility. Uh, so that's really interesting here. So the, the cultural context doesn't make sense at all. Uh, and then he doesn't root it in the context. He doesn't say because when you go outside you want to be, you want to look good to your neighbors. He roots it in Genesis 2. He says, no, this is actually rooted in creation itself, not uh, we're not going to care what the people down the street think of us. Uh, it actually, especially, look at this right here. If the Jewish worshipers, the men covered their heads when they were praying, and in, in the Greek temples, the men were the ones who covered their heads when they're praying. What is Paul doing here? It, it almost, it seems as though Paul is saying, you know what? We're the church, and we're going to take the third way. We're going to do it a different way. And so Paul is maybe prescribing a new form of worship uh, that distinguishes them from the culture, doesn't just cave to the culture. So I really like that. Uh, and so what, what is distinguished here? Well, the men are going to uncover their heads and the women are going to cover their heads. And somehow it's rooted to this idea that we're all independent, or that rather that we're, we're not independent. We are all dependent on one another. Our source comes from Christ. Woman is not independent from man, but so man is not independent from woman, and somehow this, this idea of covering the heads of women and not covering the heads of men is a way of acknowledging that. Uh, I, I will be the first to acknowledge that still sounds odd to me. Uh, obviously, there is something going on here that, that I think in our 2,000 years removes we don't fully grasp or understand. We obviously, we don't necessarily do that today, although it is still in kind of proper society. Men are the ones that typically take their hats off when they go into a church or when they go to a funeral. Uh, women will come in with their hats on. And, and so the, some of this has kind of translated over to modern sensibilities, but uh, there's, there's still something going on here. Uh, here is, uh, but the point is it's not cultural. It has a lot more to do with source than authority. Uh, and here, here's where I want to take it now. There is an example. I want to go ancient Egypt for just a little bit. Ancient Egypt, give me a different pen, uh, in the 15th century BC, there was an ancient Egyptian pharaoh, a woman pharaoh, named uh, Hot Shep Sut. You can look her up. Hatshepsut in the 15th century BC. She ruled Egypt and she was very well renowned. Uh, and the, we actually have uh, statues of her and images of her. And, and the, the one thing that stuck out to me as I learned about Hatshepsut is that when she would take the throne, she would put on a fake beard. So everyone knew she was a woman. She was leading 
wisely and strongly, but whenever she would sit on the throne in her place of authority, she would put on a beard and act like she was a man. Uh, and I point that out because I actually think there's something really profound going on here. It's as if Paul is saying, no, women are going to do the same thing as men, and they don't have to pretend to be men to do it. That I, I find the most compelling way to understand, like, what's the clarity from this passage is Hatshepsut, Paul would actually say, no, that's, that's wrong. Of course, Hatshepsut can lead. She can be the pharaoh of all of Egypt, but she doesn't have to pretend to be a man to do it. Uh, and so here, for whatever reason, it's like, let's just say he chose randomly, although I think there's more to it than that. Um, but he's saying, look, we're going to distinguish the sexes. Uh, men, you're going to keep your head uncovered, even though the rest of the culture does it the other way. We're, we're, we're paving a third path. Men, you, you uncover your head. Women, you cover your head. That's going to accentuate and distinguish the sexes from one another. Men are men and women are women, period. Uh, and now you're both going to do the same thing in church. You're going to pray and prophesy. Women, you're going to pray and prophesy. But women, when you pray and prophesy, you don't have to pretend to be a man when you're doing it. That, I feel, has so many ramifications and applications for us today. Um, even in my own life, there's been plenty of times where I, I want to emulate someone uh, ahead of me so much that I, you know, when I first started preaching, I just started, I sounded like my mentors verbatim. I just basically said, the only way that I know how to be a leader is exactly like this other person who I really admire. And so there's, there's definitely that kind of imposter syndrome going on. And uh, in, in our culture at large, there's this sense that, well, for women to get ahead, they have to lead like a man, <clears throat> right? Uh, and I think Paul would add, this verse actually speaks into that. That, that. That's a current problem in our day to day. And that Paul is saying, no, of course, women can pray and prophesy just like the men. But when they do it, they can find a way to do that out of their own sex and gender. They can do that as a woman. They don't have to pretend to be a man. They don't have to put on a beard like a chap suit uh, to do so. Uh, so that's my main takeaway here. I think Paul is saying leadership, both men and women, go for it. But distinguish yourselves and recognize, one, that you're, you're dependent on each other, but you're also different. Uh, you don't have to just morph in and look like the other person. I don't as a man, I, I don't lead like a woman, and a woman doesn't lead like a man, but we both actually lead. We both perform the exact same roles uh, within the church, uh, which I find really compelling here. Uh, lastly, because of this, a woman should have authority over her head because of the angels. I'll do a little footnote here. I think, uh, and other scholars think, there's something going on with the strange passage in Genesis 6. I'm not even going to touch that right now because we're out of time. But this one, uh, the phrase, woman should have authority over her head. The ESV and other translations render this uh, as a symbol of authority on her head. And why that's important is because the question here, this is the, o the only time the word authority shows up in this passage, the question is going to be whose authority? <clears throat> Some look at that and think that the head covering is a symbol of the man's authority or the husband's authority over her. And so some have tried to use that passage to say uh, women can lead in the church, they can even teach as long as there's a head pastor who's a man over them somehow. There's a, there's a male authority over her, then she can lead. Others will take it more hardline and say no, women can't lead in front of men, period. Um, but they look at this verse and, and think that Paul is referring to the man's authority over her as a symbol. That actually doesn't line up with the Greek. There's a great uh, article I'll link below, but uh, Gordon Fee in his commentary for 1 Corinthians talks about how you dig into the Greek, that phrase, the authority over on her head, always means that person's authority. Uh, and so it, is it the man's authority? I reject that. I think it's the woman's authority. It's like the crown that says I'm supposed to be there. And so... Uh, for whatever reason, again, Paul is saying, look, men, you're not, you're gonna, you're gonna have your head covered. Women, you're gonna cover your head. And verse 10 seems to be saying, by covering your head as you stand up on the stage and you begin to pray and prophesy in front of the church, it's the sign that you're supposed to be there. So it's her own authority. The, this head covering is not the man's authority over her. The head covering is her own authority, uh, her 
her crown that says she's allowed to be on the stage. And so because of this, a woman should have authority over her head. She's the one that has, it's her authority that she has, and the head covering is a symbol of her authority, not of a man's authority over her. <laughs>